Good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Ani Agnihotri. I'm co-chair of uh, US India Business Summit. It is uh, our pleasure and honor to welcome you all on behalf of Georgia Tech Cyber, ACIR, uh, USIBRC, and China Research Center. Uh, I welcome you to our uh, webinar titled India, Ch India China Border Standoff economic and strategic implications. With this, I would request Dr. Robert Kennedy from ACIR to welcome all of you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as uh, Ani said, I'm uh, Bob Kennedy, president of the Atlantic Council on International Relations. Uh, and thanks again for joining us so early in the morning. It's certainly a great pleasure for the council to join again with the uh, Georgia Institute of Technology Center for International Business Education and Research and the U.S. India Business Summit. And we welcome you to this webinar on the India-China border standoff, economic and strategic implications. As many of you know, under the direction of President and General Secretary of the Communist Party in China, Xi Jinping, the People's Republic of China has embarked on what many in Asia and elsewhere view as assertive and perhaps aggressive policies in the region. Recently, the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, noted China uses coercion and aggression to systematically erode autonomy in Hong Kong, undercut democracy in Taiwan, abuse human rights in Xinjiang and Tibet, and assert maritime claims in the South China Sea that violate international law. Today, we will focus on yet another serious challenge that the PRC is posing on the India-China border, examining the historical and legal aspects of the border standoff, as well as its economic and strategic implications. And now it is my pleasure to turn the meeting over to Ani Anihotri, founder of the U.S.-India Business Summit. Ani? Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate it. Uh, we, U.S.-India Business Summit, have been partnering with Georgia Tech Cyber for almost uh, 15, 16 years in presenting these top quality programs in our part of the world. We feel that uh, these uh, programs are very important for us, for all of us, especially who are interested in, in international policy and relations. And we are honored to, uh, privileged to have this partnership again with ACIR. And we welcome uh, all of you and uh, everyone in audience to uh, please stay connected with us for our future programs and uh, encourage us with your suggestions and comments and critiques. With this, I would like to turn over to my colleague from ACIR, uh, Tony Guzzoli. Tony. Thank you, Ani. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Director of Programs, we're most pleased to be able to partner with you. This morning, we have two outstanding panelists who are going to focus on international treaties and agreements, as well as the uh, historical steps that have brought us to the point where two of the most populous nations armed with nuclear weapons are at a very growing hostile standoff. This morning, we have Dr. Mary Ellen O'Connell. She is the Robert and Marianne Short Professor of Law and Research Professor of International Dispute Resolution, Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, University of Notre Dame. Her work is in the area of international law on the use of force, international dispute resolution, and international legal theory. The author and editor of numerous books, including most recently, the Art of Law in the International Community and Self-Defense Against Non-State Actors. A Fulbright, <clears throat> excuse me, fellow at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo. She also presented at the fifth annual Justice Stephen Breyer International Law Lecture at the Brookings Institute. She's also an associate attorney in private practice with the international law firm of Covington and Berlin in Washington, DC. Not and anymore, Tony. Oh, I beg your pardon. That, that was many, many years ago before I went into the academy. I stand corrected. But I did work on international boundary issues then, so it's not in, un, uh, not irrelevant. All is not lost then. 
Dr. Kyle Gardner is a non-resident scholar, Sigur Center for Asian Studies, George Washington University, Elliott School of International Affairs. He received the PhD in history with distinction at the University of Chicago, has written extensively while living in South Asia. He is with McLarty Associates, consulting clients regarding regulatory and policy age issues in South Asia. He recently published a book on the India China border <clears throat> issue, The Frontier Complex. Published worldwide, it has received rave reviews by his peers. He's fluent in French, Hindi, Tibetan, and Urdu. Dr. Akal, you're invited to begin the session. You have approximately 18 to 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. This is such an important discussion and I wanna set the uh, groundwork for the rest of the uh, uh, presentations today. I want to first set out the wider context of international boundary law the fundamental, the narrow dispute um, um, that we're most interested in today that inspired this discussion is uh, with regard to the 2100 to 2500 mile long border between India and China. So that will be my focus, but I want to start by looking at the broader context, the um, international law of boundaries, because that's the set of terms and the set of concepts within which this um, now increasingly violent conflict is occurring. Then I'll talk about the specific claims within international boundary law that are being made by India and China on their mutual land boundary, and then um, discuss some of the means for settling under international law those legal boundary disputes. Many of my remarks and many of the principles of international law depend on historic developments on various um, claims based on past uh, actions, especially pre-colonial uh, and then colonial history. And so I think it'll, uh, my remarks will then uh, lead to Kyle's more specific focus on the history um, quite nicely, seamlessly, at least that's the plan. All right, so let's begin with boundary concepts. Borders, boundaries, frontiers, for our purposes today, we can use any of these terms um, interchangeably uh, along with others. What we're talking about are these imaginary legal lines that convey, set under international law, the extent of a state's jurisdiction. And that means it's authority over land, water, and atmosphere. Um, as well as the human activities that are occurring in those various spaces. So disputes over borders, as you can imagine, this is implicating the very power that a state can exercise, where it can uh, send its troops legally, where, it's, um, where it can exploit resources and so forth. So this is really the stuff of, um, of sovereignty. And as a result, it leads to the most dangerous, in my view, conflicts that we have um, within the international community. So the um, um, knowing where a boundary is, having well-defined boundaries under commonly understood terms of international law is key to peaceful, harmonious, and productive international relations. It just could not be more important. Um, boundary disputes have always existed. It's always um, uh, difficult and interesting to see how states have tried to expand their control or, or how they've tried to withdraw from problematic areas. But we're seeing a new set of boundary disputes within the last 10, 20 years, driven largely from two developments in the same time period. First, we have new technological developments that are leading to the ability to exploit natural resources to a greater extent than was true in the past. So um, resource extraction, mineral extraction, but also the ability to fish in ever farther and deeper waters. At the same time, we're seeing the effects of climate change, or as I prefer to call it, climate chaos. And that is having, uh, bringing increasing pressure 
um, onto these resources, making them ever scarcer and therefore driving more competition for control of areas that were once left in a gray zone, not well defined because we didn't have human activities at the top of the Himalayas, for example. So we've seen uh, the drivers from both technology and climate um, change creating ever more um, disputes, intersections, and, 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 and irritations in areas that um, were once more ignored because of uh, these problems or these developments hadn't happened. So just to prove my point about the increasing or the importance and, and the danger of not having well-defined boundaries, we can, I can just mention a few very well-known examples before we go um, into the broader principles that should be defining these, these different um, border areas. Israel-Palestine, one of the longest running um, conflicts that has fed, of course, to other conflicts. It's led by a d debate dispute over where Palestinians should have jurisdiction, where Israelis should have ju jurisdiction. And then behind it all are the increasing resource pressures on fresh water, on arable land, and so forth. Um, and I would add to that, as I usually do, that the Israel-Syria conflict over the occupied Golan Heights is part of that uh, border conflict problem. And then we have the um, Russia-Ukraine. This is a, a border conflict. Who should have control of Crimea and the eastern Ukraine? And then um, the most lethal of all conflicts that is ongoing today, the civil war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is about secession. This is about who should control what areas of Congo. And of course, behind it all is, is resource extraction and uh, wealth and power. So I hope that proves that this is an, a very important topic to be discussing today. Um, let's talk about the fact that international law um, really has excellent principles for bringing legal clarity, finality, and stability to international borders. And if you think about the world today with 193 fully sovereign states, most of them don't have border disputes. Their borders are well established under these principles. So we do have uh, really a, a, a very effective way to prevent these kinds of conflicts by clarifying where one government, one state's authority um, ends and another begin. So these principles um, rest first on historic claims, historic borders. Most of the borders in the world have been in existence now for at least 50, 70 years. European borders, Asian borders, some borders have just been so long and well accepted. We don't go back to figure out how they began, who has the right claim. They're settled, they're stable, and under international law, there's going to be no um, ability to bring up a new claim. So Kyle can tell us if there are areas along the, the, the uh, 2000 plus 2000 plus mile border between India and China that falls into that well settled, no more debate category. The next um, probably a preferred way of settling boundary disputes is by treaty. These are a standard way of determining where our present boundary is based on past treaties or creating a new agreement under a binding treaty uh, defined by and implemented under principles of international law. Boundary agreements have a special durability over other kinds of treaties. The way they have been traditionally interpreted will be the way they should be interpreted going forward. They um, uh, are not easily overturned by practice that varies from the treaty. We really want stability in treaty law and treaties are um, one of the more important ways that we determine boundaries. In the case of former colonies, the International Court of Justice has made very clear that the Latin phrase uti posidatus applies to post-colonial boundaries. It's had half a dozen decisions now um, mostly from the Spanish speaking world, but also Africa, in which it has made clear that uti posidatus 
is the rule that prevails. This rule, those of you who know Latin, the thing as it's possessed at the time of independence, the border at the time of independence, even if it was an administrative border within a larger colony um, uh, controlled by a European state, will continue as the independence border from, from the time of independence forward. We don't reopen those administrative colonial boundaries. Where there is no historic border, no treaty, and no colonial administrative border, the important rule and this will come into play in the India-China uh, boundary um, very importantly and in many stretches of the boundary, the rule of prescription applies to land boundaries. This, the rule of prescription holds that a long, peaceful, undisrupted administration of an area is where the boundary will lie. It's always possible to determine which state of two competing states has the better record of administration or prescription, providing laws and governance for an area than another one. It's just a heavily fact determined rule and courts are very good at applying their analysis to determine which of two contenders has the better record of peaceful administration. The most important thing to know about peaceful administration um, of a boundary under the rule of prescription is the critical date. When did the peaceful administration without protest, without conflict, disrupting it begin? And it is from that date that you look to determine when the border um, has been in the hands of one party or another legally uh, titled in one country or another. The, the critical date. Now the date, um, why the critical date is so important is because many states try after the critical date to build up a record of administration. They'll start building roads. Does this sound familiar to our current conflict? They will start um, uh, moving in populations as Russia has tried to do. This doesn't work. Once the critical date is set, you look at the administration prior to the critical date. You can't create a record of administration after the critical date to try to get uh, um, territory that uh, is not legally yours. For maritime boundaries, the rule in dividing maritime uh, space, ocean space, depends on the geographical uh, relationship of the contending parties. Are they opposite states? like the UK is opposite from the Netherlands, then you will use the median line between the two states up to providing a, an area of up to 200 um, mile ex exclusive economic zone. If the states are adjacent as Germany is with the Netherlands, then you will use a rule of equidistance from the land boundary, but adjusted for special circumstances. That's well established under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it's being applied regularly by the International Court of Justice. For freshwater, if it is not determined um, under a treaty or by a historical border title, then the rule tends to be um, the median line for lakes, as in the US Great Lakes with Canada, or the deepest channel when it is a river, as um, uh, as with the Rhine River um, in Europe. So freshwater is also quite easy, three levels of determination for the border through a freshwater body. The um, final point, general point on the context of boundaries is what doesn't count. And this has come into um, play quite a bit in the current boundary that we're talking about. First and foremost, and this may come as a, a surprise to many of you, I hope not a shock, um, we don't ask the population. We do not determine boundaries under international law through popular referenda. It just won't work. Boundaries would never be stable. They'd be constantly open to popularity contests, shifting, and this does not promote peace. So while it's been tough, and it is open to negotiation by the parties to create by treaty as, as the Czechs and Slovaks did alternative arrangements by popular will. That is not the basis that a court would establish a boundary. 
Second, and very important in this case, military force. We do not establish boundaries on the basis of military force. It has been clear since the adoption of the United Nations Charter in 1945 that military conquest of territory will not lead to good title. And it does not matter how long a party might have been in occupation of a territory that they took through military force, even lawful military force, exercise in self-defense. That conquest can never crystallize, harden into um, or that legal occupation zone cannot harden into good title by the party that took it through military force. So we know about some long running occupations they can go on for decades as Israel's occupation um, of the Golan Heights and of the occupied Palestinian territories or Russia in Crimea um, or China in Aksai's Chin, this will not lead to good title. The final one to exclude um, is the natural land boundary. This has also come into play in some of the, the um, debates between China and India. There is no such thing in international law as a natural boundary. Just because this happens to be the highest mountain range somewhere between two states and you could create a, a geographic separation based on the highest point um, of, of, uh, of a mountaintop, we don't have that as a notion. It's too unstable. It's too open to um, uh, uh, changes that are much more important, such as peaceful administration or prescriptive boundary. What does happen, though, with rivers and high mountain ranges like the Himalayas is that these become the natural administrative breaks. It's much easier to keep your administration on one side of a very high mountain range than on another, on one side of a wide river than another. So naturally over time, historic borders or uh, prescriptive borders will follow natural divisions, but this is not a concept on which we can base international boundary claims. So let me say a little bit more specifically about the uh, Chinese versus Indian um, claims in the uh, in their mutual uh, boundary area, their land boundary area. That critical date, when should we be looking for prescriptive historic um, boundaries to determine which state has the better legal claim um, to specific areas along this very long border? Probably it's 1950 when um, uh, Prime Minister Nehru made clear that he was objecting to China's um, uh, actions with regard to, to Tibet and also made it clear that India's colonial boundaries as in place in 47 when India got independence would be the legal boundaries um, going forward between India and uh, China. So I think we can use that as our critical date, but maybe Kyle has another date in mind. It certainly would be the first thing a court would want to establish with regard to these parties. Then if we look at what I think uh, most people commenting on the border are looking at the three main sectors, Eastern, Central, and Western along this long border, India and China have different arguments with regard to each of those sectors. The Eastern sector, according to India, has an established border from a 1914 treaty, the Simla Convention, um, and that established what the, the famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, McMahon line. The Chinese dispute that that is a valid treaty that could have um, uh, implications for this boundary because they take the view that Tibet was not a state with capacity to enter into an international agreement. The central sector, India points to a 1954 treaty between India and China, not for the establishment of the border, but for a refre reflection that China had accepted or acquiesced in a, in a particular border in, implied in that 1954 treaty. China rejects this. The Western sector, India again, sees that there were treaties in place um, at the end of the colonial, British colonial period, and they established the border, treaties from 1842 and 1684. So that would be the Uti Posidatus 
boundary in the Western sector. Again, China disputes whether those, uh, those treaties have the effect that China, uh, that India believes that it has. So the third point I wanted to make on means of settlement, as I've just, just briefly described, and we'll hear more from Kyle, these borders are all, this border dispute is fundamentally a legal dispute. How could it not be? Borders are legal constructs. And the negotiations to try to resolve, to clarify where the prescriptive boundary is or the status of treaties has been going on for decades, since 1950 uh, at the least. These borders, in my view, really lend themselves this type of dispute to final settlement in a binding dispute resolution mechanism. The best place to go to get an authoritative determination of all these questions I've raised is the International Court of Justice. It has the most gravitas, it uh, commands and has the most experience in settling boundary disputes. But there has been good success also with binding arbitration. India and Pakistan have had some success in uh, boundary delimitation in an area called the Ran of Kutch. Once a boundary is determined and you've got a authoritative judgment as to where the legal boundary should uh, lie, then there's scope of course to negotiate around that solid uh, starting place for compensation for um, uh, people to have some ability to move if they want to be in one state or another. These things can be well um, uh, taken care of in negotiations. But I think at this point, this particular dispute would uh, be advanced if we were able to move to binding dispute resolution, international court or arbitration. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. O'Connell. Dr. Gardner, you have 18 to 20 minutes. Great, thank you all. And, and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for putting this together. Uh, and thank you to Dr. O'Connell for uh, what I think was a, um, was a fantastic overview of the legal landscape. And now it's my job as the historian to say, well, it's more complicated than that. Um, and to do so- Oh, I didn't say it wasn't complicated, Kyle. Um, but so in order to, um, to sort of help with some of the more sort of granular aspects, I put together a few slides here that um, will give us, I think, a, um, a little bit more um, situation, both spatially and, and temporally here. So uh, what I wanted to start with was just kind of a very brief um, overview of, of the main areas here for those unfamiliar. Um, we have really two central territorial disputes, one in the northern part um, where India, China, and Pakistan meet in a, uh, a high altitude Switzerland-sized plateau um, where famously in the words of India's first prime minister, not even a blade of grass grows, um, Aksai Chin. Um, and uh, that is, has been kind of the, the central arena of of this past year's uh, dispute. And then a second territorial dispute, um, which uh, Mary Ellen referenced with the McMahon line uh, in the sort of far Eastern Himalayan region in the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh, which uh, China claims is South Tibet. And then finally on this map and kind of lurking here, um, uh, legally, historically, uh, somewhat ambiguous is, of course, the, the region of Tibet. Um, so let's move to the next slide. So um, the problem itself is a, oh, back one. The problem itself um, is a fairly straightforward one. There is no border, no mutually demarcated border uh, between India and China, but the roots of that problem are predictably pretty complicated. And for sort of ease of, of analysis here, I'd like to sort of think about this in terms of long-term causes, medium-term causes, and short-term causes. So the long-term causes, um, and we can in some sense stretch back to really the you know, very sort of founding of Ladakh and, and the Tibetan empire as far back as the 10th century, but really the takeaway from the, the sort of pre-colonial period is that we're dealing with a region um, 
as in much of the world, uh, that didn't have border lines, um, but had border points, concepts of, of um, political space that did not necessarily need to be fully delineated on a map. Um, and, and this was in the case of Ladakh in particular, uh, for the fairly simple reason that as the name Ladakh suggests, it literally means land of passes. When you're dealing in mountainous terrain, um, the, the points of transition from one political space to another are usually marked uh, at, at points where, for instance, um, a road going between Kashmir um, and, and Ladakh meets at a pass, the Zoji, the Zoji Pass, the Zoji La, uh, and that is an effective point where you can do all of the work uh, that, a, that a border might do, tax people and, um, and, and so forth. Um, when the British came in, of course, uh, they did not see things that way. And shortly after uh, the East India Company conquered the region um, and put together the state of Jammu and Kashmir as a princely state in 1846, um, they set about surveying it and, and they, um, they, they went uh, to that category of, of border that, that Mary Ellen referenced towards the end of her presentation, uh, that is to say the natural boundary. And they thought that the, the best way to make a precise um, border unlikely to generate disputes was to go, was to apply what was called the water parting principle, um, which was to look to the limits of the watershed um, which frequently, though not always, uh, coincides with a mountain range, and uh, and that would be the the principle applied there. They applied other principles in other areas. Mary Ellen referenced, for instance, the the Talveg principle using the center, the border point of a river. Um, these are all sort of being developed largely by European powers in the 19th century as more. Uh, more supposedly scientific ways of, of carving up territory, um, which were then reflected on, on these maps, which were becoming uh, much more authoritative um, quasi-legal instruments uh, to, to point to uh, and determine what belonged uh, to whom. In terms of the medium-term causes, um, and this could really you know, have a, a segment devoted to it, um, in itself, we're dealing really with um, with sort of uh, three kind of periods. One is the uh, the inheritance of this kind of unilateral uh, attempt at at defining uh, a Himalayan border, um, which India inherited uh, in 1947 at independence, and then shortly after with um, the consolidation of power by the People's Republic of China. 49 and then the subsequent invasion of Tibet to establish or um, in, in some sense reestablish uh, political authority over Tibet. Um, from, the nine, from 1950 onwards, um, we're really seeing a, a tremendously complex series of political uh, maneuvering on the part of uh, India's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru on the one side and Zhou Enlai, uh, the Chinese premier on the other. And here, I would just highlight kind of three, I mean, this is a, an incredibly complex back and forth. It starts off fairly friendly, but tensions uh, grow over um, a whole series of, of issues um, culminating eventually with uh, the fleeing of the Dalai Lama in 1959, India's uh, reception of the Dalai Lama, uh, and then subsequent um, border skirmishes that eventually led to the 62 war. Uh, but two points really worth highlighting here um, are that in 1954, um, Nehru uh, decreed that the undefined borders on many of India's maps uh, should, be, uh, should be defined. Um, and shortly thereafter, and not related, but um, in order for China to really, uh, or the People's Republic of China to really better um, secure Tibet, um, uh, they began constructing a road from Xinjiang to, uh, to Tibet uh, through the Aksai Chin. This was discovered um, 1956 or 57 uh, by a Ladakhi uh, reincarnate Lama on his way back from Tibet, reported to the government of India. 
um, and, and revealing kind of the problem that the oxide chin in particular um, is uh, <clears throat> effectively non-state or has been historically effectively non-state space. Um, it was never really effectively occupied or permanently occupied. Why would it? It's a desolate high altitude wasteland um, where, you know, unfortunately these days soldiers are, are posted to, but nobody ever permanently inhabited it um, and claim historical claims to it are, um, are, are sort of dubious at best. Um, the 62 war and subsequent um, uh, rounds of talks beginning really in the 1980s in terms of short-term causes, um, these sort of move into the realm of um, more speculation because we have fairly limited insights into uh, the workings, particularly of uh, the government of the People's Republic of China. Um, but analysts have pointed to a number of, of, of causes, road building um, to an advanced post in Ladakh being one uh, that I think is uh, worth pointing to because road, road building in general has been uh, a pretty substantial source of tension here. Um, also, uh, in late uh, in 2019, the change of status of um, the uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, divided uh, by the Indian government into two Union territories: the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and the Union territory of Ladakh. Union territories have uh, are directly controlled by the central government in Delhi, and that may have raised some concerns. Um, uh, and then also, I think analysts have pointed to uh, geopolitical realignments, the uh, assertive, assertiveness slash uh, aggressiveness that, that, that Bob referenced uh, at the start of our, our seminar. Um, and, then, and then most recently in May of last year, um, skirmishes taking place um, at two points in particular, and then uh, in, in um, uh, June, uh, a, a fatal encounter, really the first uh, in, in 45 years along the border. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. This is just an illustration of one of the, the borderless maps that the, uh, was produced during the time of, of um, the, the um, the colonial era and really highlights uh, the fact that a region that was long assumed by by colonial surveyors to be a, a natural uh, a natural boundary and an easy one because the Himalayas is some of the largest mountains in the world uh, should um, at least to the British colonial surveyors sensibilities form a neat line that they could survey uh, this proved not to be the case in the oxide chin which is topographically much more complex and doesn't afford any any natural lines um, of, of, um, for use in delineation. Uh, next slide, please. So then we get to the present here and we really have uh, a situation um, that uh, ha shows very little signs of, of movement. Uh, good options are limited, uh, particularly given the, the, the rhetoric uh, from both sides um, and uh, in some sense, the limited incentives to, to resolve the dispute. And I suspect um, the, the next panel may dive more deeply into this, but you know, it's worth pointing out that at this point, the, you know, if, we're, if we're talking about um, incentives here, uh, you know, China um, at this point, I think is able to use the border issue as a fairly low to medium stakes pressure point um, uh, you know, to, to distract or to, to provoke India uh, if necessary. And India can, of course, you know, use this to um, rally domestic support. And so it's not entirely clear uh, that, the, uh, that the resolution of, of the border issue um, is necessarily a high priority or that, or that both sides have sort of sufficient uh, leverage or interest for a compromise. Uh, let's go to the last slide here. Um, so in terms of looking ahead, um, and this is something that I think historians are probably most cautious to do, but in, in terms of kind of thinking about these two principal um, territorial disputes, uh, we, we have, I think in the Oxide Chin, uh, a relatively safe zone of conflict, emphasis on relatively, um, because 
it is resource poor, it is inhospitable, um, never permanently inhabited, which produces all sorts of international legal problems when it comes to uh, arguments of effective occupation. Um, uh, but I, I would imagine is um, in some sense a an easier uh, um, an easier zone of conflict to contain. Um, and it also, I think, uh, has greater strategic value for China, but less so now because of the infrastructure that China has, has really built over decades to uh, better establish control over Tibet and Xinjiang. And so that, that particular linkage there, that road is I think of, of, of perhaps less, um, less strategic value. And, and for India in some sense, it is first and foremost uh, a cartographic uh, claim, this um, going back to uh, various maps, and we can discuss these if of any interest in the Q and A. But uh, maps originating in, in the colonial era, uh, but being inherited um, at the time of independence, and and sort of creating a fairly high degree of cartographic uh, ambiguity. The 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 I think more complicated future is is probably uh, there in the eastern sector with um, Arunachal Pradesh. Um, it's ethnically and religiously complex. Um, <clears throat> it is home to the largest Tibetan Buddhist monastery pictured here um, outside of Lhasa uh, and, and um, has historical ties to, uh, to Tibet in, in ways that bring in kind of Dalai Lama politics, which have um, long been a source of tension. And then of course, there are water politics. This is home to the, um, uh, the Brahmaputra and um, the Yarlung Tsangpo, same river, just different names depending on where you are. Um, and of course, the threats of dam, uh, dam building and, and, um, and climate change here. So, I mean, I think in, in our, um, in our Q&A, we can perhaps discuss how, how the, the historical record fits or, or doesn't necessarily fit into some of the, um, the categories that, that Mary Ellen described, because you know, I think there are on both sides and have long been uh, historical claims, claims to treaties, uh, and and some degree of competitive administration or, or prescription. Um, but these uh, <clears throat> are are far from uh, unambiguous. And uh, in in the case of treaties, in particular, uh, complicated by the fact that uh, the status of Tibet uh, has long been. An ambiguous one, and going back uh, even before the Qing Empire and the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China. Um, so, with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it back to Tony. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. We have approximately seven minutes uh, in which we have some questions that I like to throw at you, which there's probably an hour explanation on each of your parts. So, I do apologize in advance. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. O'Connell, if I bring a layman's uh, uh, perspective to this. Uh, as I sit back and I've listened and uh, have read about all of the boundaries and the agreements and so on out there, my question essentially is, for all agreed protocol and the five, agree the five agreements that India and China have signed, there's a continued intransigence on one or both sides to strictly adhere to these agreements. Are there fundamental flaws in these legal instruments or is there an intrinsic disagreement so deep within both parties that the most precise legal instruments cannot penetrate the depths of the sovereignty that they both claim to? Tony, I think the uh, core problem between having a better relationship, a more um, uh, productive and mutually respected relationship, including com stricter compliance with the many agreements that China and India have uh, reached, comes back to their differing legal contentions over where the boundary lies. And it's just come to the point where a third party has to have, uh, with the expertise in these legal matters, to look at the two contentions and to make a decision that the international community 
will respect and support and demand that these two countries also respect. So while, for example, Kyle mentioned how um, low the population and human activities are in the Oxide Chin area, that does not in any way mean it is not subject to a authoritative determination as to which of the two states has the better claim. And that would resolve a long standing problem that had led to armed conflict and this long running um, occup military occupation. If India has the weaker claim, then China doesn't have to rule that area as a military occupation anymore. India can accept it. Same with, uh, with the Eastern sector as well. So um, let me just clarify a bit um, based on Kyle's comments, and maybe this uh, speaks to your question as well, Tony, that it is not a question of effective occupation. It's a question of admi administration, uh, the actual functioning, the carrying out of, 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 uh, of governmental operations. And that can be as small a governmental operation as creating a survey map. That has been evidence in the International Court of Justice, for example, in the Central American boundary disputes uh, back to Spanish colonial times and an indication of where the boundary was accepted at that period on cartographic principles that you can extend even where there has not been an actual line drawn on a survey map or um, human habitation. So we do have the principles within international law to clarify this boundary legally if the parties would finally move to that clarification, get those debated issues that have been a cloud over this entire region and led to obviously fatalities and other ongoing problems that really need to be cleared up, it will be much easier to move forward with mutual respect with other treaties. So this is just a long running, very deep seated, very emotional and contentious problem that is long overdue for clarification. Thank you. <clears throat> it would appear uh, your IJC uh, uh, point is well made, uh, uh, <clears throat> the International Court of Justice. Dr. Gardner, it's been reported that almost 90% of the underground water in Chinese cities is polluted, as well as approximately 70% of China's rivers and lakes. One major Indian expert has predicted an Indian population of 1.4 billion by 2050. And at one at the same time, India will have become water scarce by 2050. Water is life for all of us. And your judgment is China's diversion of water from Tibet to the north of China, what may ultimately introduce a life death dimension to this border conflict. Uh Thanks for that question, Tony. Um, I think you're you're absolutely right to highlight the importance of of water politics, especially moving forward in this conflict. And actually, uh, not too long ago, uh, it was announced in China's uh, latest five-year plan uh, that several major run of river dams would be built on the lower reaches of the uh, Yarlung Tsangpo, uh, which turns into the Brahmaputra uh, in India. And uh, unlike with Pakistan, India does not have a water sharing uh, agreement or treaty. India and Pakistan uh, signed in 1960 the Indus Water Treaty, uh, which has endured uh, three wars um, uh, and you know is the subject of, of sort of cyclical anxiety, but has has more or less been respected. No such uh, water sharing treaty exists between India and China, uh, although there have been, I think, since 2006. Um, several um, memorandums of understanding uh, signed over over data sharing, uh, which occasionally, which have been respected, and then and then uh, and then were discarded. Uh, so the uh, the anxiety around water, especially for downstream uh, parties, is 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 intense. And of course, on the case of the Brahmaputra, you also have Bangladesh further downstream uh, that is also. Uh, watching, watching these sorts of rivalries with concern, the the bigger issue around water is is um, is is absolutely uh, central to I think any uh, analysis of the conflict going forward, especially because the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas uh, are the headwaters um, or contain the headwaters of 
Asia's 10 largest rivers by volume, which you know, indirectly feed 47% of the world's population. So um, there is uh, a, an absolutely, um, uh, a, it's, it's, it's impossible to sort of underscore just how, um, how large the issues of, of, of water will become. And then of course you have uh, climate change, which in the short term has in some cases led to uh, an acceleration of, of glaciers melting um, various environmental in instabilities and, and all sorts, but in the long term could potentially uh, play into this as well as you know, glaciers feed not just the Brahmaputra, of course, but you know most of, uh, of India's rivers. So water politics is absolutely central to this. Thank you so much. It's time now to turn this over to my colleague, Ani, uh, so that there will be questions and answers. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I really appreciate uh, comments from uh, Dr. Barry Allen and Dr. Kyle Gardner. We have some questions. Uh, and for, uh, for the sake of time, keeping on time, I'm going to be asking only two, three questions. <clears throat> First one is to Mary Allen from Dr. John McIntyre. Under the rule of a prescription, uh, which is virtually like squatters' rights when violating the existing boundary at the time of independence. How long does one need to occupy the land to occupy the land to claim its right as yours? Yes, um, that will is the sort of issue that needs to be determined by a court um, because it does have several subjective elements to it. It would certainly be the typical um, decisions on that question of prescription, we're looking at decades, not a few years. There has to be a period in which administration has gone forward with the acquiescence or the um, acknowledgement of the other contending party that this has, uh, that this is accepted. So that is a, again, a very heavy fact-based determination. Um, sometimes it requires going well back in history to find the time when the uh, when there was enough time, enough clear acceptance by one party or the other that this is the correct um, prescriptive uh, party in terms of the title claim. Could I also, Ani, just respond briefly to one of the questions I saw in the list? Somebody mentioned the China-Philippines decision and they inadvertently said it was at the International Court of Justice. It was not decided there. It was, a, it was not about boundary disputes because that China has, it had excluded those. It was an arbitral decision about China's environmental obligations in the maritime space. And it lost that decision very decisively. There are other ways to implement then, to, and, and the people were looking for China to leave its maritime boundary claims under that decision, that's not what the decision was about. So I don't think that case undermines um, what I've suggested here as the ability for the International Court of Justice to clarify these boundary contentions um, quite satisfactorily and in a way that is almost self-implementing. So it's a very different case than the Philippines, um, China one. Thank you, thank you for both. My next question is to Dr. Kyle Gardner. Uh, Kyle, uh, using headwaters or rivers may not be a reliable principle to, decline a, to define a boundary. They are constantly shifting and the old Greek saying is worth remembering, no man steps into the same river twice. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. And in fact, I mean, one of the reasons why the British um, and not just the British, but um, uh, but theory, geographers, um, surveyors, uh, and, and uh, in some cases, 18th and 19th century legal theorists, uh, why they shifted from the use of, of rivers um, or, or sought to avoid uh, rivers uh, as, as boundary making objects is per, for precisely that reason. I mean, especially in, um, uh, in, in the plains um, with seasonal water flow, you can get uh, the, the location of a river um, can, can change with each season. Uh, you also have the, the sort of kind of um, 
I guess, uh, political problem of tending to have the same similar people on both sides of a river because rivers tend to uh, draw people together. So for that reason, in mountainous areas at least, it became from the perspective of these sort of boundary making experts in the 19th century, much preferable to use the limits of a watershed, um, which at least topographically and theoretically would align to, you know, a, a neat mountain range or, or, um, or, or line of high terrain uh, that could then be surveyed and used for the line. And this is where this was um, largely the principle applied to the Durand line uh, um, and um, the McMahon line, uh, which was which was referenced earlier. And uh, I've, there, there have been some sort of, there are points of complication along the way, but by and large, that was the principle that was applied by the British, which was reflected in, in their maps uh, and surveying, um, but, but not always uh, certainly successfully. And in the case of the Oxai Chin, uh, it was you know, actually found that what was assumed to be part of the Indus River watershed uh, was actually part of uh, the Tarim Basin, uh, which is an, uh, an endorheic uh, basin that is sort of flowing into itself uh, in Central Asia and kind of the Northern Tibetan Plateau. All right. Thank you, Kyle. My next question is to both of you. And after that, Tony, please take over. Uh, this is from Mr. Michael Ott. Uh, given the asymmetry of the relationship uh, India has always with China as its greatest strategic rival, while China does not uh, regard uh, this at the same level of importance, does China has greater latitude to prosecute its claim over a longer term of period? Dr. O'Connell, perhaps you might take that first. Definitely. I mean, this is another advantage of moving to the international legal sphere on these issues. Law treats all subjects equally before the law, China and India are equal. This levels that playing field that Mike Ott is talking about. It gives each party an equal chance under the prevailing um, neutral principles to prevail. So in all relationships have some asymmetries. That's why we instituted law to try to create the kind of neutral principles that uh, will lead to peaceful settlement of disputes and not make decisions of this kind dependent on who has the bigger army, the bigger war chest, the, the, the larger population, these, uh, or even the greater, uh, the more charismatic national leader um, who attracts more um, popularity on, uh, in the international community. None of those things are what we as a, a, a world have decided should be the determining factor of the extent of a country's legal jurisdiction. We have these neutral principles. And uh, while Mike Ott's suggestion is that India will do better out of the neutral principles, in fact, both countries will benefit hugely by having a clarification um, around the border and then to work out cooperative agreements once they have this baseline in place and they know who needs to shift money or resources in whichever direction to accomplish their national goals. So again, it's, uh, it, it's a problem we deal with well in international law and um, India may seem to have the, the greater reason to go for these international solutions, but really China in seeking to be a rising power in the world has only to benefit by compliance with and honoring, respecting. Remember, think about everything we're gonna hear in the next panel. China relies on treaties, contracts. It needs these to be honored to fulfill its, its foreign policy plans. So this, is, this would be a great starting place to beef up the international law that China is uh, dependent upon. Thank you, Kyle. I, I, I think that just about covers it. I would only add that um, <clears throat> I think there is a, there is a historical wariness uh, to involve uh, third parties uh, in dispute resolution uh, in the region. And this has you know, obvious uh, ties to colonization and the history of, of European empire um, 
and sort of domination uh, more recently uh, by certain superpowers in the Cold War. Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, while uh, the, the argument for uh, equality under an international legal framework um, uh, may be appealing, I think there, there are also sort of competing uh, and perhaps more shorter term uh, issues of self-interest that um, would certainly be at, at play here and would, would push particularly um, an advantaged party like China away from perhaps uh, uh, giving up its, um, uh, its sovereignty, uh, as it were, to, uh, um, to an international legal mechanism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, both of you, uh, for this, um, you know, uh, highly educative presentations. Is uh, we just scratched the surface, so to say. With this, I will turn it over to Tony to solve this problem. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Uh, O'Connell, Dr. Gardner. Thank you for the time you've given us, the clarity you brought to this research uh, issue, this broader issue. Uh, I turn this now over to my colleague, Dr. John McIntyre, Executive Director of Georgia Tech's Scheller College of Business. It will begin the second round. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much to all of the participants in the first panel, Mary Ellen, Kyle. Thank you for providing a good foundation for the complexity of the various issues of boundary disputes between the two larger states probably in the world, but certainly in the area. So far, accepted principles of international law have really not prevailed in resolving the, the issues. And we have seen the outbreak of occasional military conflicts with a potential for contagion. To expand the focus based on the first panel and turn to our second panel and look at some of the strategic, economic, and business implications for the Indo-Pacific area we have three outstanding experts that have a lot to contribute, and I apologize to them in advance. Time is limited. We have till about 11.45 this morning. Let me introduce them and then turn it over to them. Uh, I'll have uh, the moderator's privilege and ask a few questions, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, Annie will run and moderate the questions from the audience. Our first panelist is Abe Denmark and he's a senior fellow at the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, and is based at the Wilson Center in Washington, leading the research component on geopolitical dynamics of the Indo-Pacific area. Also contributing extensively to uh, analysis on the US-China relations. So it's, it's really quite good to have you, Abe, to really provide a more China-centric perspective. He's also uh, an occasional instructor, professor at Georgetown University. He has authored the recent book, which I highly recommend, U.S. Strategy in the Asia, Asian Century, Empowering Allies and Partners with Columbia University Press. He's a contributor, and I've seen many of his uh, articles in Foreign Affairs, The Atlantic, etc., and served as a past Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia. Uh, is a graduate of the Corbell School of International Studies in Denver, well known to those of us who follow foreign policy. And currently also, I don't know why he finds the time, is seeking uh, a PhD at King's College London. Uh, the second participant is an old friend of the US-India Business Summit and of cyber. And we have been uh, pleased to really host him in person in Atlanta in the past. It's Richard Rossa with senior advisor and Wadwani chair uh, in US-India policy studies at the CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Uh, you spent 16 years were in various capacities, uh, strengthening the partnership between the US and India. He served as also a director for South Asia at McLarty Associates and also as extensive private sector experience. Also, I note that he served as Deputy Director of the US-India Business Council, one of the extremely well-known leading advocacy groups based, uh, if I recall, in Washington. And then uh, our old friend, Dr. Anupam Srivastava. Anupam is a non-resident fellow at the Henry Simps Stimson excuse me, Center and a former Managing Director at Invest India. So I think 
with the CSIS, with the Stimson Center, with George Washington, with the Wilson Center, we have a, an extremely deep representation of Washington-based expertise. A few more words about Anupam. I've known Anupam for quite a while, and uh, for a while he was at the University of Georgia at the Center for International Trade and Security, a center specialized in dual-use export control, where I myself some many years ago was working on that particular issue. But Anupam has deep expertise uh, in the field of uh, business uh, and issues uh, regarding high-tech industrial sectors, particularly dual-use export controls, munition, munition items and the like uh, relating to licensing and enforcement agencies. He has extensive experience, is most welcome. So without further ado, having sort of done short shrift on presenting these uh, three gentlemen's uh, credentials, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Abe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. Thank you for having me uh, join such a great panel today. Um, before I get started, uh, first, I just wanted to um, uh, offer my uh, uh, condolences and thoughts to your community in Atlanta uh, for the recent pain that you've been suffering. I, our, our, our thoughts are definitely with you and your community. I also wanted to note that these are my views alone, not those of the Wilson Center or the US government. Um, I'll be discussing today the uh, roots and implications of the India-Chinese rivalry um, and as we previously discussed, I'll be talking mostly from the perspective of uh, Chinese leadership on these issues. Um, so I would note that um, relations between China and India actually started out fairly well uh, in the 1940s after the partitioning of India in 1947, the establishment of the PRC in 1949. Uh, India actually sought to maintain good relations with China. It was one of the first countries to recognize the PRC. Um, yet in the 1950s, the relationship quickly grew into a rivalry um, and ties have been fraught ever since, uh, including the, a border war in 1962, uh, the Sikkim skirmishes in 67, uh, the Sumdongrong Chu Valley skirmish in 1987, uh, and the, the Doklam standoff in 2017, and then the border uh, skirmishes that we've seen more recently. Uh, the two countries continue to harbor uh, disagreements over that shared border, as we've discussed, uh, but also a range of other issues, including the, the Dalai Lama, uh, China's security cooperation and economic cooperation with Pakistan, trade, um, as well as the broader geopolitics of South Asia and the Indo-Pacific as a whole. Um, so what does China want um, in this dispute? First, I would point to the terrific research uh, done by Taylor Fravel at MIT uh, noting that China's approach to these issues has historically emphasized maintaining stability on its southwestern frontier, uh, which they define as preventing the escalation of armed conflict on the border uh, and to maintain a dominant position in the dispute that it enjoyed before the, the border war. For China, its dispute with India has always been a strategic, strategically secondary uh, uh, um, issue um, and not the primary focus of its military strategy. That it, but it has defined stability as maintaining dominance on the border and deterring India. Um, so that's important to, to note going forward. The second uh, aspect of what China wants, I think, is that um, of what's driving China is that the border area speaks directly uh, to China as a broader manifestation of the rivalry between China and India. Um, and I would actually argue that's one of the reasons why established international laws um, discussed in the first panel have failed to resolve this border dispute from China's perspective, uh, the rivalry grows out of, uh, the border dispute grows out of the rivalry and the border dispute won't be fixed until the rivalry is addressed in some fundamental way. Um, and to me, the rivalry, uh, to China's perspective, the rivalry comes out of two broad issues. Uh, the first is geography, which nobody can fix. Uh, the border areas claimed by both sides contain an important road link that connects the Chinese regions of Tibet and Xinjiang. And I'll talk about the importance of that in a bit. Um, and I would note that uh, China's construction of this road between Tibet and Xinjiang was one of the triggers of the war in 1962, at least one of the proximate causes. Uh, but even before then, there had been a series of violent skirmishes between the two sides after the 1959 Tibetan uprising, when India granted asylum to the Dalai Lama, uh, which it continues to extend today. Beijing suspected that India had been undermining Chinese control of Tibet 
um, a suspicion that some in Beijing continue to harbor to this day. Um, in fact, I was actually in New Delhi um, when Xi Jinping came to a visit and there were significant protests um, uh, about Tibet across New Delhi. Um, and the rumor had been that Xi Jinping had, had pressed Modi to uh, make a commitment to the India's version of the one China policy to which Modi had refused. At least that was the rumor at the street at the time of Xi Jinping's visit. So these issues continue to be pretty significant in their bilateral relationship. China also at the time objected to the uh, India's forward policy, the so-called forward policy, and sought to ensure that the PLA retains a superior position along the disputed border. Um, but the second and I think more significant driver of this rivalry uh, from China's perspective is uh, strategic considerations that for decades in different manifestations, many in China have seen India as a rival for strategic leadership in, the, in, in Asia. Uh, during the Cold War, this was exacerbated by Indian efforts to both lead a non-aligned movement, uh, but also by, its, by India's close relations with the Soviet Union, uh, concerns that were intensified uh, by the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, to, the mind in, to the minds of many in Beijing, India was both a pawn of Moscow and a rival for regional dominance uh, that they believe was, right, uh, was and is rightfully China's role to fill. Today, that sense of rivalry continues for many in Beijing, uh, but it's not something that they like to discuss. Most uh, strategists in China prefer to compare themselves to the United States um, in, in terms of strategic rivalry. Um, the approach to this relationship uh, from India uh, to India uh, comes from the Chinese perspective from an assumed position of superiority. Uh, yet, and that, I think that's another reason why uh, international law has not been particularly attractive for many in Beijing. Um, just as um, previous panels were discussing the assumed equality of, of states in international law is not something that China often agrees to when it comes to India. Um, they don't believe those international laws were established fairly, um, and they believe that um, they'll get what they want by issuing, by resolving these issues bilaterally, not by um, going to international institutions, international using international law. Um, but this begs the question to me, why now? Why has this issue inflamed in the last few years? Um, so I think there's several possible reasons about what inflamed this. Um, and there, there, a lot of people have pointed to some proximate causes. Uh, displeasure with India's actions in August 2019 to end uh, Jammu and Kashmir's traditional autonomy. Um, um, uh, additionally, China's uh, uh, concerns about India's road construction in the area as a change to the status quo um, and a threat to its uh, superior position on the border. But to me, these are proximate causes. They're not the real drivers. I think there's really three deep factors that drove Beijing to act in recent years on the border. Uh, the first is the realization that China's military capabilities were fast outpacing that of India, uh, leading to a growing conventional military imbalance. Uh, there's a dichotomy here that uh, in China's perceptions uh, that assumptions of, China, of Indian weakness seem to call for more pressure, whereas perceptions of Indian strength are seen as indications of hostile intent. Um, and here I point to the great research by Yun Sun from the Stimson Center, uh, who noted that China's condescension and India's frustration culminated in the Dolkwam standoff in the summer of 2017. Uh, and Yun Sun described this standoff as a watershed event in China's policy towards India, specifically because India's assertiveness forced China to reassess India's strategic, strategic capability and India's resolve. The reassessment challenged much of the previous longstanding bias that colored China's judgment, including the simplistic and as, as Yunsun described, the simplistic and static view of India's inferior status in the regional power hierarchy. Second, um, the second, I think, deep driver of, India, of uh, China's approach was to demonstrate strength in the face of the significant domestic and international headwinds. Uh, facing a dramatically slowing economy, criticism of the government's handling of the outbreak of the coronavirus and worsening ties with many countries, uh, China's leaders, I, I believe, and I again point to the research of Taylor Fravel on this, um, uh, may have believed that they needed to show strength uh, and avoid signaling any weakness over questions of national sovereignty. This is especially true, I think, when it comes to India um, and issues of uh, that, that the border issue speaks to, specifically uh, Xinjiang and Tibet, 
But we've also seen China act more assertively and aggressively when it comes to Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea. Um, but um, again, as, as Taylor noted in 1962, Chinese fears that India sought to profit from unrest in Tibet and, up, and upheaval from the Great Leap Forward uh, influenced Beijing's decision to go to war in 1962. So uh, uh, as the 2020 pandemic unfolded, it's certainly plausible um, that China may have sought to signal toughness to India again. So beyond these first, these two deep factors, I think the third deep factor of driving China's approach to this rivalry is displeasure of India's closer, uh, closer ties with Beijing. Uh, I'm sorry, with, with the United States. Today, the US factor, I think, is the most significant consideration in, the, in China's policy toward India. Uh, that China, China's leaders see the India rivalry primarily through the lens of China's burgeoning competition with the United States. They're deeply concerned, that, especially the PLA, the Chinese military, is deeply concerned at the prospect of facing the US Navy uh, in the Western Pacific, along with um, the militaries of our allies in, in uh, East Asia, the US and Indian navies in the Indian Ocean, and the Indian Army and Air Force on its southern border. Um, so prospects for the future in terms of implications about this rivalry and the border disputes. Um, so China's leaders are likely to continue to deny Modi's demands on issues of importance to China uh, on a range of issues, not just the border dispute, but also in terms of uh, the CPEC projects ongoing in Kashmir, um, declaring uh, Masoud Azhar to be a terrorist, et cetera. Uh, China's leaders likely believe that they came out fairly well from the recent crisis. Uh, they were able to look tough, uh, both to in internal and external audiences, um, and were able to seize the narrative on issues like Ladakh. Uh, future incidents, I think, are certainly possible. Uh, but uh, we should recognize that from China's perspective, these incidents, should they occur, are not a mistake. Uh, they're rather, I think, seen as a, 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 a tool of coercion, a tool of negotiation um, between, China, between China and India. Um, but at the same time, I would expect to see Beijing attempt to build warmer ties with India, um, prim primarily to keep New Delhi from getting too close to Washington. Uh, they expect that there are significant hindrances to the U.S.-India cooperation and that it would collapse under pressure. Um, so hearing this, some of you uh, some of the, in the audience may be asking how China believes it can keep India away from the United States, while at the same time putting more pressure on New Delhi on especially sensitive issues. I think that's a great question, a great, a great uh, concern. And to that, I would say welcome to Chinese foreign policy. Um, this is a dichotomy that you see across the board on Chinese issue, on Chinese foreign policy. Uh, China's leaders seek deference in international affairs to the needs and interests of the Chinese Communist Party. To their mind, India would avoid trouble if they would simply recognize China's rightful geopolitical superiority and defer to China's interests. Anyone who studied Indian politics, and especially uh, Modi, know that's not going to happen in this case. So the key questions to me going forward or how far the Chinese will be willing to push India and how Washington and New Delhi can build resilience and substantial cooperation into their relationship. Uh, to, that my, to, to that point, I think the recent Quad Summit, um, today's visit to India by the Secretary of Defense and other areas of intensifying cooperation between India and the US are likely deeply disturbing and concerning for China's leaders. I expect that it, the future incidents along the border are certainly likely, certainly possible, as a reflection of deep suspicion between the two sides that shows no signs of subsiding, as well as China's efforts to further demonstrate the rising geopolitical power and deepening um, lack of confidence in China about their ability to maintain security in rest of areas like Xinjiang and Tibet. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Apologies for the audio issue, uh, issues, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've raised a lot of uh, hot burning issues and uh, just wait a minute. We'll be asking a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, we next turn to, uh, to Richard. Richard, uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, please. Yeah, let me just follow up on a couple of points that, uh, that Abe brought up that I think really uh, I want to underscore because they're just fantastic uh, thoughts. Um, this is one of those weeks um, when we're going to look back, you know, 20 years from now and say that, you know, the relationship 
deepened significantly. And I say that because, you know, for the Quad Summit to have happened and, and bear no bones, the Quad is the thing that India is involved in that China is concerned about the most. And for the fact that in a period when China is trying to, um, uh, you know, offer some, some uh, I think, some uh, warming of relations with Delhi and India still follows through on the meeting of the Quad, I think for a lot of Americans and Australians and Japanese, I felt that um, you know once once things began to thaw a bit more with Beijing again, India would be the first to pull back from the quad, and instead India chooses to go through with a leader summit. Uh, once a decade, you know our capitals send no notes to each other, uh, signals uh, that things are about to move into overdrive, and I think uh, India following through on, on elevating to a leader summit while Beijing is taking some steps to repair relations. Um, this is one of those very, very consequential moments. So I'm glad that Abe brought up the uh, quad meeting and of course the defense secretary going out there. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, why China is choosing to provoke at the border, there's, there's a whole lot of areas, of course, that India looks at and say that China is actively provoking. Um, you've got issues uh, from Delhi's perspective on unfair trade relations with China, China flooding the Indian market with goods, uh, concern, of course, that a lot of countries share. Um, You've got issues about uh, China's heavy engagement with uh, a lot of India's neighbors, not just Pakistan, where there's a long history, but a lot of other neighbors. And in fact, when Modi came to office seven years ago, most of his direct neighbors had a better relationship with Beijing than they did with Delhi. So repairing those relationships has been a real prioritization. Uh, cyber issues. Uh, you know, a lot of the chatter today in Delhi is about the recent uh, Red Echo hacks that have been taking place of India's power grids, a report released by a U.S. institution about how well China has been able to uh, um, uh, to, uh, to drive uh, cyber intrusions across India's power grids and potentially a, a major outage that happened in Mumbai might be a link to that as well. So so border is certainly there, but uh, boy, that's only one of uh, a range of issues that Delhi looks at and says, you know, China's provoking on a bunch of fronts. I should point out there are areas of collaboration. You know, they continue to work together in the BRICS and creation of this new development bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, some smaller regional infrastructure initiatives, uh, China has joined the, sorry, India has joined the Shanghai Cooperative Organization. So uh, it's not all confrontation as well. Uh, Delhi does have some threads, you know, as two large countries would, you know, for more positive areas of cooperation. But it is interesting to see that, um, you know, from China, there's been questions about whether India should be able to continue in the in BRICS if they're also going to be a member of the Quad. So, <laughs> you know, suddenly a little bit difficult to balance these uh, these multiple things. But my own read on the recent uptick in border provocation in the last couple of years you know, you did see India begin to spend a lot more time and attention on the threats that China presents in the maritime domain. And ultimately, you know, the cold, empty hills, you know, is not really the prize. Maintaining lines of trade, and particularly the oil imports that flow through the Indian Ocean, you know, is going to be crucial. And you've seen China go from no military presence in the Indian Ocean region to operating up to 14 military vessels simultaneously in the Indian Ocean. And what I mentioned about their increasing cooperation with uh, maritime states and the development of strategic infrastructure, uh, India began to, uh, to ramp up. Uh, they're, they're now building their first domestic carriers. Um, they're they're signing agreements uh, and really sort of uh, building out relations with their own maritime neighbors throughout the region. Uh, the Indian Air Force uh, and its ability to project power, you know, across the maritime domain is growing as well. So, uh, you know, it is funny, just one small pop in the border and suddenly a lot of Indian attention uh, and, and budget decision making it's probably going to go back to uh, to land-based uh, assets, which uh, plays exactly into what Beijing would like to see. You know, reduced uh, reduced attention on the maritime domain. We'll see whether or not. I mean, India again is big enough where they could probably manage both uh, to fill out a mountain core, buy additional equipment to be able to serve what they need in, in mountainous warfare if that happens, while also simultaneously devoting budgetary resources to the maritime domain. But uh, John, let me jump in now to uh, to, the, to the stuff that I was meant to focus on a bit more, which is. You know, what have been uh, the impact on uh, in terms of what India has done uh, in terms of uh, economic and commercial relations vis-a-vis -vis China, but of course a lot of this has got direct relations with the United States as well. Since coming to office uh, seven years ago, almost eight years ago, um, or almost, almost seven years ago, uh, the Modi government has um, really kind of focused on um, uh, commercial issues in, in, in novel ways, ways that uh, really a lot of his predecessors had never really done before. I would say that in terms of what it means for international firms, uh, Modi, you know, really has become very pro-investment, but also very anti-trade simultaneously. A lot of domestic reforms, uh, they liberalized areas like uh, like oil and gas, creating a national taxation system, reforming bankruptcy laws, 
Uh, more recently, they moved a major ports bill that's going to allow more private sector engagement and flexibility for ports operations and, and liberalizing foreign investment regime. Uh, uh, removing foreign investment restrictions where they existed in a lot of sectors and, you know, his own personal courtship of foreign investors. I mean, this is a shocking turnaround where, you know, my own work at the U.S. India Business Council, when we would host prime ministers, when they would come to the United States, uh, they'd always want to kind of meet the foreign CEOs in private, you know, sort of sneak through the, the lobby of the hotel, you know, come through the kitchen door rather than the main door. And, you know, you get about 10 minutes worth of notice. Um, whereas Modi, you know, when he comes to the United States, you uh, He's on stage. He's, you know, he's hugging, you know, foreign CEOs and, and promising new areas, which that unto itself, you know, the fact that you see that there's a boss who's rolling out the red carpet uh, is, is such an unusual step. So the investment side, you know, he really built a, a lot of momentum right out of the gates. On trade, though, it's been a very different story. Uh, you see India dramatically hiking customs duties every budget and sometimes in between budgets, uh, impairing U.S. companies' ability to export to the market and, and hurting market access. You've got a growing number of sectors where you need to produce stuff locally, otherwise you can't win government contracts. And a lot of industries, government-owned companies are the largest companies, and a lot of contracting goes to government. So that's been a major area of impairment. And India's been withdrawing from uh, some pending trade agreement talks. Uh, I think most notably the RCEP agreement, which included China, but uh, also they've, uh, they've, they've stopped or delayed uh, trade talks with Europe, with Australia, with Canada, with New Zealand, and, and, and multiple others. So, so trade's been a relative weakness, and you can imagine what did that happened, um, you know, during the Trump administration when you know we had a president who was willing to fight anybody and everybody simultaneously around the world on trade. Well, India certainly presented a pretty meaty target because they were actively taking steps to uh, to close the market to foreign companies, and a lot of U.S. companies that saw market access limited were petitioning the government and making a lot of noise. So. You know, I think India, for the most part, this is driven by the fact, of course, that uh, they have a massive trade deficit with the world. You know, here in the United States, we're grappling with our own approach on trade. And this isn't just a Trump thing. I mean, certainly you saw that even in previous administrations. Um, the United States trade deficit as a percent of GDP, you know, is somewhere around two or three percent of our GDP. India's on a bad year is double digits, 10, 12, 13 percent of GDP. That's the size of their goods trade deficit. And while they make up for it somewhat in a surplus they have on services trade, we all know, you know, this vibrant IT services market that India has. Still, when you think about the creation of jobs and people that don't have as much skills and much options, you know, creating basic manufacturing employment, you know, really is what a lot of governments, the United States and others focus on. And so, um, so you've seen this, uh, this pullback on trade, which is driven by something very real and tangible. You know, India has not been able to be competitive with the world. And in particular, China most years is their number one trading partner, and it's about a four to one surplus in China's favor when you look at goods trade. So, um, so China itself has been driving a lot of India's anti-trade sentiments. Up until recently, most of India's reactions on closing the border to trade have been applied globally in nature. So even though they may have China in mind, it actually has been you know, really directly impacting American companies. So, so you know, both of us kind of shadow boxing China on trade issues, uh, we've actually been hitting each other with some pretty serious body blows in recent years. Um, you know, I think overall, if you look at uh, um, you know the track record on on, on opening up the economy and reforms, uh, Modi came out of the gates uh, seven years ago uh, pretty fast. That first year in office, um, a number of significant reforms. We've got a tracker that we do of 30 big reforms anytime a new government comes to office. And the Modi government during its first term, uh, a five-year term, they managed to do nine of these 30 reforms that we were looking at, but six of those happened in the first year. So clearly. A lot of big reforms or reforming the economy out of the gates, and then a huge slowdown period. And I'd say at the end of its five-year term and the beginning of its second five-year term, you saw really a reversion to issues that are that are more based around, you know, this Hindu fundamentalist ideology. You know, a little bit of that was discussed already, but you know, changing the constitutional status of the state of Kashmir, the only Muslim majority state in the country, or changing you know an accelerated path to citizenship for most religious uh, that flee to uh, to India except Muslims and a couple of other religions, but predominantly Muslims. So you began to see the Modi government moving on some of the other issues related to another part of its uh, political base, you know, sort of this Hindu fundamentalist group. But COVID seems to have kind of shooken uh, the government out of this, uh, this different pathway and back on the pathway of economic reforms. So the last 12 months, you've actually seen the government move on a number of significant reforms, many of which have been things that American companies have been asking for. They now allow foreign companies to own a majority stake in defense companies. So 
you know, if you can't sell as much to India, can you start building domestically and start winning contracts that way? We got a lot, a lot more scope to do so. They moved on uh, significant labor reforms that have been asked for by domestic and foreign industry for a lot of years. Um, just today, just, just before I joined this call, India's upper house of parliament amended its insurance laws to allow foreign uh, majority foreign ownership in insurance companies. Uh, it still needs to be approved by the other body of parliament. Even these contentious farm bills that, uh, you know, triggered even uh, the U.S. pop star Rihanna to, uh, to to put out a tweet that sort of blew up in India a little bit. I've been through the farm bills. This is going to be agriculture modernization that has long been needed. They still have protections for farmers that aren't going to be able and capable of modernizing. But if you go through the substance of the bills, it's exactly what global economists and others have been calling for for quite some time. Let farmers grow. Let farmers avoid these, these, these horrific mandates, these middlemen markets that they sell to. So even some contentious things like the farm bills themselves, um, I've been through, I've read, I think they've got support from a lot of corners of society. Um, it's just become a tough political issue because sometimes the opposition is only looking for that. And there are real issues. Some farmers are not gonna be able to take advantage of modernization. But when you got 50% of the population working in basic agriculture and producing you know, less than 20% of GDP, uh, a lot of modernization and productivity uptick needs to happen there. The, uh, the other area that Modi has focused on, sort of relaxed focus, but has now paid new attention, and this is a huge impact on the business environment, are Indian states. India has 28 states. And if you think about doing business in India or engaging India on development priorities, ultimately decisions these state governments take have far more impact. I mean, most everybody wakes up and they think, you know, what did Modi have for breakfast? What's he doing today? But if you're living in India and you think about, do I have electric power? Do I have water, sanitation, education, healthcare? All these things are almost exclusively delivered to you or not, depending on what's happening with your own state government. Modi's party, despite you know, a pretty good run politically in the country, uh, only controls about uh, uh, less than half of Indian states today. So a lot of the decisions too are far outside Modi's grasp. Um, and Modi has been challenging states, offering a little more transparency on which states have better business environments and really trying to stoke, to, uh, stoke states to take uh, uh, in interesting reforms. But still, you know, state governments face a very different set of political pressures than we would all recognize. Uh, farmers demand free electricity, and any state government that's ever tried to change that has been voted out of office. Uh, everybody wants free water. A lot of basic services and utilities that are also important for industry. Uh, these systems are pretty much broke across India. So a lot of tough things that they're grappling with. Now, last thing I'll wrap up with, John, is just looking specifically at China. Um, with the ramping up of pressures that you've seen, I talked about goods trade already, you know, and a lot of indirect steps that India's taken over, over the last seven years. But there's some more direct steps that India's taken just in the last couple of years that have a more of a specific focus on China, which uh, you know hopefully will take a bit less pressure on this global application of, of harmful trade practices that's hurt the United States. Um, three in particular, India is tightening scrutiny for uh, any foreign investment that comes in from neighboring countries. So the actual regulation that was issued last year said any countries with which India shares a border will go through additional government scrutiny of any foreign investments that are coming in. And they already had regulations along those lines that were governing investments from Pakistan and Bangladesh. So clearly this is uh, pointed very much towards China. Second, uh, India has been actively banning apps. You know, there's concern that Chinese apps uh, have been proliferating and that data going back to China, where does it go to from there? Can the government or the, the Communist Party demand that information? Are there security risks related to that? You know, it's an issue that we're certainly thinking about and grappling with. Uh, India has actually moved forward on it pretty fast. So they've, um, they've actually banned hundreds of uh, Chinese apps, including TikTok, from being on, um, on, on Indian mobile devices. Um, the third area, which is uh, more prospective, but could, uh, you know, big steps could be coming along the, the, the could be coming along pretty closely, is uh, is restrictions on data flows. This goes back to the whole area that may actually hurt the United States uh, commercial relationship with India pretty dramatically. Um, it's not all driven by security concerns, but India is looking at adopting a core data privacy law, and uh, there's there's other relations related to cross border e-commerce and non personal data and information flows. So you see a, a lot of increased attention, potentially limiting India's ability to move data uh, back and forth between countries. And uh, of course, data trade, IT services trade has been practically the lifeblood of US-India commercial relations for the last 20 years. So if India takes uh, steps along these lines and it begins to impair uh, US-India data services trade, well, that's gonna have a huge impact on the commercial relationship. So some of it is about the United States, You know, concerns that companies like Amazon and others 
soaking up vast amounts of consumer information. You know, that is something where it's so valuable that it shouldn't be simply given offshore, you know, without some kind of fee or toll that's kind of attributed to it. But a lot of the data concerns are more security related. And if, uh, if India takes steps that impair data flows in ways that hurt us India IT relationship, you know, that could be pretty painful. So, uh, so a lot of, a lot of areas of provocation, even beyond the border, John, that I've tried to cover here, uh, some of it, Modi's overall approaches to the economy, but then a lot of these specific steps that you've seen India take and that they may take, you know, that have more direct relations with China. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Richard, for an insightful review of uh, the internal Indian uh, economic factors which might impinge on the resolution of these long-lasting boundary disputes. We next turn to Anupam, who has a, a PowerPoint, uh, and uh, I believe uh, it is being shared with all our viewers. Yes, it is. Anupam, the floor is yours. Good, good. So my greetings to everybody, both on the panel, uh, as well as participants in the audience. Uh, John, it's uh, wonderful uh, to be part of a program with you and with Ani, with old friends. Uh, let, me, uh, let me do the following. I'll make some simple declarative couple of statements and then I go into this. Uh, the first is uh, picking up on something that Abe had mentioned and that is in a simple way, the way Beijing looks at India right now is that you are just getting in our way. In other words, China is pursuing various steps to enhance its comprehensive national power and wants to become the decisive power in the Asia Pacific, uh, reoccupy its position of preeminence as a middle kingdom, uh, as a superior power historically, uh, and in some ways uh, relegate or confine the US to its own sphere of influence on the other side, Atlantic and the other part of the Pacific. Uh, so, so there's very much this larger quest for power and in some ways it thinks that India is getting in the way of, of that pursuit. All right, so what I've done is I've just for simplicity's sake, picking up on the excellent two presentations by Kyle and Mary Ellen, uh, I've just put three possible scenarios here on how the border standoff uh, might get resolved. Scenario one is a battle of attrition and a stalemate, which I believe is very much going to continue in some form, uh, along with talks. So the Indian government says that we have now entered into a long era of no war, no peace, uh, and that they expect to continue for, for a long time. Scenario two is talking about a high intensity specific location-specific uh, conflict, which has already taken place now in Doklam. Uh, and uh, something might be brewing in the Arunachal, in the Eastern sector that, uh, that both our speakers in the morning spoke about. And scenario three is of course about substantive talks, which is happening and both Abe and uh, Rick have talked about the content of uh, India-China conversations. I might just take a personal moment here to say that as the head of the National Investment Facilitation Agency for the Government of India, in one respect, uh, at least, uh, I have not only participated and represented uh, in BRICS and other negotiations and dialogue with the Chinese government on investments and others. And yes, Rick is right, my, my good friend Rick. Uh, Modi does embrace uh, investment type of things. In fact, I have worked with him on understanding the World Bank's ease of doing business type of metrics and then working and directing agencies to do things to improve administrative and procedural uh, aspects so that India's ranking and ease of doing business go up. So he's a CEO in many ways, a very pragmatic approach. Um, so substantive uh, discussion has taken place. Let's move to the next one, please. So what I'll do here is rather than describe a wide gamut, one of the advantages of speaking after such an excellent panel of speakers is that most of this has been covered. So clearly, as I had said, China is expanding its spheres of influence uh, globally. It's doing it in economic ways that you are aware of, uh, including creative ways of dodging US tariffs, for example, and taking Chinese products and just locating its final assembly and marketing and distribution, meaning the final point from where it is sent to the US is not China. It's in Hawaii, it's in 
various other parts. Uh, I'm simplifying for the sake of uh, saving time. Infrastructure development, we are aware of. A couple of key points to make about the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative. Part of it is that in 1962, as speakers mentioned, we had a brief China-India war. Right after that, in the 1963, Pakistan leased a part of the disputed Kashmir territory to China. And that is the territory that abuts and uh, just north of it is the NJ9842 point leading up to the Siachen Glacier. And that parcel of land is what is being used today by China and Pakistan to build the China-Pakistan economic corridor from Xinjiang through this region, all the way through Pakistan into Gwadar port on the Western uh, part, about 90 miles from the Iranian Shabahar port. So with that and this construction, China will have access and permanent access to warm waters. Uh, it's got a deberthing and other type of agreements on that port. So from submarines to others can be uh, located there. It can bypass the India, entire Indian Ocean. And from there, within 24 hours, its subs and naval vessels can operate in the Strait of Hormuz near Iran or in the Persian Gulf waters. Uh, so you can see the strategic implications there. Uh, look at the slide also mentioned things like the AIIB, the uh, Asian Investment Bank, where China is the uh, lender. Uh, so not just through BRI loans, which it does, uh, and some of them are, are uh, have led to a debt trap type of situations for, uh, for Sri Lanka, uh, for Kenya on the Mombasa port and so on, uh, but also this type of structured lending to try and uh, compete with the World Bank type of things. A yuan to be proffered as an alternative uh, currency and so on. Very interesting, uh, uh, when the US tightened the FDI screening and especially Chinese acquisitions in the US high tech companies through a mechanism called CFIUS, we'll talk about this in the last slide. Uh, the Chinese investment and FDI into the US dropped from about 26 billion to almost zero. And within the next two years, it went up, the Chinese FDI in Israel went up from almost half a billion to 16 billion in just two short years. So that money, which was in search of US high technology now went to Israel where US and Israeli joint technology startup companies operate. I work very closely with some of them. So I'm telling you firsthand how that has led to uh, deep uh, uh, thinking in Israel about how do we block access of China to our own valued high tech companies. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a whole lot of things that are happening in China and the quest, as I said, is to grow the comprehensive national power. And so, as I had said, China's uh, or, or India's rise is seen by Beijing as colliding against China's sphere of influence. And that is what leads to a lot of these things. As Rick and others have rightly commented, uh, China is most concerned about the core type of things because that then allows India an additional leverage to operate with uh, Japan and Australia, but most importantly with the United States. Uh, in, in the Indian Ocean and uh, curtailing China's freedom of operation, China is also conducting what are called hydrographic surveys of the ocean beds uh, and a whole range of uh, anti-submarine warfare type of activities become part of that. So China is deeply concerned about how Quad can be leveraged to circumscribe both the propensity and the decisional latitude of China to operate freely in, in these waters. All right. Uh, I'll mention only one thing here. Rick has covered the China, India and the US India economic side of things. Just a simple thing on the FDI, as I mentioned, you look at the uh, third or fourth bullet types. So during 2019-20, the FDI and equity flows of China into India kept on growing. And even though it was a small amount, just a billion or so, the important thing was that it flew under the radar of reporting requirements in Indian companies. So it was a minuscule amount of money, but it gradually was creeping up to a reporting threshold. Uh, and this is a, it's a very clever tactic of trying to acquire a presence in the boards of companies and then begin to understand what's happening and then start doing uh, FBI and FDI deals or JVs to try and grow China's presence or extract advantage. So if they sense that India is, say, 
relatively uncompetitive on some segment of electronics or plastics and dyes, then try and ramp up that on the trade side. Uh, this came to light with uh, China's uh, People's Bank of China, which is a central bank of China, acquiring a certain stake in, uh, in an important HDFC bank in India. And that led government to do what Abe was saying, which and, and Rick have mentioned, tightening the FDI norms. Uh, the MHA, the Ministry of Home Affairs, now has a China-related tighter screening of things in FDI. Uh, FDI screening is done by different countries. I've given you some examples of the EU and the US. Uh, but trying to find the Chinese fingerprint is becoming an important part of all of this. Uh, next, please. I will uh, mention only a couple of things from here. The US and India are building a deep technology embedded strategic partnership. Uh, it's, uh, yes, there are challenges in implementation because the two sides have difficulty in working together on many things. But on the private sector side, especially, it's working much, much better. Uh, there is some frontier areas where a lot of uh, good work is happening uh, on quantum computing uh, and recently on rare earths. Uh, the US, uh, Japan, and uh, uh, Australia are working with India to expand their uh, respective rare earth mining and production type of things because these items, China used to have a near monopoly on them. Uh, that is beginning to lessen from 90% to about 58% control by China. The others are ramping up. They have vast applications in uh, electric cars to uh, a whole range of 5G uh, applications, uh, high-speed rail networks, and so on. The other is to create these resilient data networks and to design out uh, Huawei and uh, some of their components. Uh, I personally, in fact, I'm working on, or have developed something where the five Chinese OEMs and 4,000 Chinese subsidiaries uh, that need to be uh, designed out. So in other words, the US government's newest laws say that if you're pr pr supplying something to the US government, you as a supplier have to ensure that none of the components that are used in your product are either provided by these five Chinese OEMs or any of their Chinese subsidiaries, which now number more than 4,000. So that is the level of work that's happening and coordination between them. So I'll make a, a sort of historical point here on the top bullet, which is that China will leverage its Haping uh, Chi, which is a peaceful rise. Uh, and traditionally, this is what China has done. It'll keep expanding its spheres of influence until the returns on investment turn negative. In other words, where the marginal cost becomes zero. The cost of expanding further are too much. That's where China's borders usually end up stopping. Uh, interestingly, China has taken a foreign investment law tightening and Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, uh, issued this unreliable entity list uh, in September last year. It's very interesting to see them. I have actually the experience of training, providing training to the Chinese MOFCOM people and the MFA. And so to see that, and this is China's way of saying that we can also issue a CFIUS type of regulation against US and other companies. Uh, as I said, the approach to build comprehensive national power remains very strong. I remember one time I was doing a lecture at the PLA Academy, and I showed them that on most indices of power, China was number two in the world. And I said, surely that should be enough in 225 countries. And they said, no, we have to be number one. Uh, I've had same experience with people who built China's uh, or drew up China's Haping uh doctrine or the Kaige Kaifang team that built the uh, economic restructuring programs they all have this thing of, we have to be number one. And that grows very strongly, comes across. So I will just end uh, with the following couple of points that despite all difficulties in implementation, the US and India, given their shared strategic interest long-term, are continuing to find ways to settle procedural problems and continue to enhance cooperation. It's acquiring a more strategic connotation also to a growing extent with Japan and Australia on certain things, uh, based purely on convergence of core interests. But it's not an easy thing to be uh, designing China out of your, uh, of your calculations. Uh, and that's not the intent either. They just have to find a way to adjust and live with China. And I just end with a sort of Hobbesian choice we have that we have to hang together or we hang separately. Thank you for your attention. John, back to you. Apologies. Thank you very much, Anupam. Um, I, I have some questions. I have very limited time, but uh, 
uh, one question in the trade area, one question for US policy, and one question regarding military strategy. And that will be enough for 10 minutes, I think. Uh, we have noted that uh, India has been uh, supplying various armed systems globally, most recently the purchase of Rafale fighter aircraft from France, I think about 20 or 18 such aircrafts. Um, and uh, tying that to the visit of the US Secretary of Defense to Delhi today, as noted, uh, are we, what, what are the what is the range of policy options available to the United States in the matter of the Sino-Indian border conflict? What can the US do? Uh, on the one hand, we see India arming itself. On the other hand, we see China keen on confining India to a land-based armed strategy, uh, staying away for perhaps from maritime power projection. So what are the options, and particularly directed at, at aid, what are the policy options for the US in coming years, focusing specifically on the boundary disputes, but obviously broader than that? As with most border disputes, I don't believe it's in the US interest to try to weigh in um, on, on these disputes. But I do think that we can work closely with India on issues that, um, that affect them in terms of their military calculations. I am hearing a bit of an echo. I don't know if somebody needs to, to mute or not. Um, one being, and I think, and Rick mentioned this, I think it's an important point that um, India can invest in both its ground power and its air and naval power as well. That I think the United States would have an interest in working with India to make sure that they don't over invest in ground power, but continue to invest in capabilities relevant to the Indian Ocean um, as well. Both, um, uh, I think, primarily in the calculation that one of the best ways India can compete with China militarily is not on the ground, but at sea and in the air. Um, and that it would be in their interest to continue to invest in those, in those capabilities. Yet at the same time, I do think that the United States would have an interest in helping ensure that India has the, the ability to defend its own borders. Um, and I think that would primarily involve um, helping India in terms of um, uh, uh, the, so the less, um, the, the less uh, prominent aspects of military power, uh, things like ISR, um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, um, so they can see what's happening. They can communicate better uh, in these difficult areas. They, the ability to rush um, logistics um, two border areas that are difficult to get to. I think these are the areas where the United States would be able to help um, India maintain control over its borders, maintain some degree of deterrence with, uh, with China, while at the same time being able to invest more effectively in air and naval power. I think the United States would like to see India continue to emphasize its investments in the military sector. Uh, Anupam, do you want to add anything or, or Richard? to that uh, military... Yes, certainly, certainly. Overall. So just very briefly, very briefly, so India has a, uh, there is still an echo here, but... John, you India need to is... mute your, you need to mute. Okay. I'm muting. Okay. So India has a um, program to build a nuclear submarines. Um, they've just commissioned the third one, the fourth one is under trials. Uh, this is a nuclear variant. Uh, they're also, uh, they've designed the hull weight of, uh, of another missile. So there'll be more naval propulsion and better diesel submarine engines that India is fielding. Expanding that, the advanced light helicopter that they've de developed for this work, uh, version. Naval variant of a light combat aircraft that India has developed uh, or is developing, which will be used as part of the maritime exercises. The air-to-air -air missiles, uh, that will be dedicated to this. And uh, some satellites that they've launched in the last couple of years, which will provide high resolution signals and other intelligence. So I think India is fairly clear in its quad and other Malabar type of exercises that it continues, uh, that it requires to continue investing in its naval power targeted at specific capabilities. And it's going to do that while also finding resources to develop capabilities on the, on the land front.
Uh, some of the uh, some of the agreements that the United States and India have signed in recent years too have direct application. Um, you know, probably most notably is one of the most recent agreements we signed, the Basic Exchange of Cooperation Agreement, where the United States is going to supply our most advanced geospatial intelligence to India, and that allows them to you know study maps for targeting things like that. But some of the defense sales, you know, sometimes we write off defense sales as simply kind of a byproduct of the relationship. But look at some of the equipment sets that we've sold, or even more recently leased India. You got M777 light howitzers, you know, quick mobility into the mountains in case things heat up. Uh, Chinook heavy heavy lift helicopters to get you that stuff to the mountains. Apache helicopters, terrific for mountainous warfare. And then the uh, the lease that we did recently, which is a relatively new model for India to procure equipment on uh, armed uh, armed surveillance drones. So. Um, so a lot of the things that we've done, um, you know, actually have a real world application, you know, so we, we, we focus a lot of times on the big stuff and the Navy and the water and, you know, I, I don't know if I'm covered those and they're terrific. And the land stuff, we actually have some pretty good successes too, in terms of how we work together in the equipment we've ample supply. So, you know, once again, I think we can, we can walk and chew gum pretty well. Uh, second question, real quick. Uh, obviously, China is not part of the, uh, I mean, uh, India is not part of the RCEP. Can we expect the Biden administration to restart perhaps or attempt again at recreating a trans-Pacific uh, trade alliance in, of which India could, uh, could be a party? I'll just say, I, I see no inclination, zero negative maybe, mm -hmm. uh, inclination from India to, uh, to get engaged in any kind of substantive trade agreements. I think if we're gonna get anything, and we've been talking about a narrow US-India trade agreement that is simply removing a few of these recent impediments. This is not a an FTA. This we call it a trade agreement, but it's. But you know, I, I think some of the areas that you know that uh, that Abe and Anupam have pointed out, where you know we, we both have a shared concern about China. You know, their their domination of pharmaceutical ingredients and the the threat to limit those. You know, when COVID was sort of you know having the onset, uh, the, the 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 stranglehold they've got on critical minerals used for technology manufacturing. There's a lot of overlap of interest here, so I think there's a good basis. The only trade area that's kind of kicked its way in the security conversation so far, I think, really has been kind of 5G. But you see critical minerals and APIs and others starting to move in that direction, as evidenced by the quad. So I think there's some substance we can move on. You know, um, we're not quite there yet, but maybe 5G at least is pointing a bit of a bit of a pathway. But you know, this is an area that my two colleagues know far more about too. So I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Uh, real quick. Prediction as to likelihood of conflict in the coming 12 months? I know that's that's a dangerous kind of uh, question. Anyone wants to, to take a, a shot at it, so to speak? <laughs> I see you're all muted. I, I follow the old baseball <laughs> adage of I never make predictions, especially about the future. Okay. Well, in that case, the future is not too hard to, to foresee, but uh, Anupam, uh, you-, you I, I'm guessing that was Yogi Berra. Defense purchase systems, yeah. defense system so I think, purchases. I, I think uh, Abe was using Yogi Berra, and so I can, I can channel him as well okay. and say, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's oh, what yeah. he used to say. Now, very quickly, there might be some skirmish on the Eastern border but that would be more for jockeying and China testing India's will. You remember uh, a year plus ago in Bhutan in an area called the Chicken's Neck, China dominates the, the heights there and they were positioning themselves and building a road from there. They could uh, surveil and attack uh, parts of the capital and beyond. And India managed to work with uh, Bhutan to uh, push them out. So there might be jockeying and slight types of things, but not a major war. Uh, it's the rest of the scrambling and pre-positioning and fortifications that are happening that will grow in intensity, but maybe not in the headlines. That might be the approach. I look at your concluding slide, hang together or hang separately. Yes. Who do you apply that to? I was talking about the Quad countries and others. Uh, so yes. you might see a loose polarization where China has acquired certain uh, modern technologies from Russia and it's consolidating its power. I'm not suggesting a doomsday or China versus the rest, but I'm saying there is a gradual, uh, deliberate, uh, and, and I don't want to downplay the threat either. Even when I go to Trinidad or Caribbean, Chinese who are very bad at offshore oil type of things are consolidating their presence there. 
it's it's amazing when you Nicaragua they have bought a property where the new canal is being you know built. So China has a plan and a growing influence, and they they deserve a, a certain higher station as the second largest power in the world. But the way they do this ends up creating a polarization, and so that's why I had mentioned this that. If, as far as the quad is concerned, if we if we do not coordinate our activities, then we might separately try and deal with Beijing. Beijing and Beijing ends up winning those bruising wars of attrition anyway. So you might hang separately, so you get a better deal by hanging and coordinating, and that's the uh, stated goal of the quad. Thank you very much. Uh, my questions hand here, although I have a bunch of others, and I turn it over to Annie for moderation, curating of the Q and A's. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, I thank all the panelists here. So some time back, we received a question from Mr. Jenti Lal Patel. Uh, why can't leaders of both the countries, i.e. India and China, work out under Operation Warp Speed to solve their issues? Okay. Well, as we said, it is, it is not in China's interest. It does not intend to do so. And so it's uh, you know, solving problems at one level would seem very fundamental and instinctive, but countries pursue things as part of stagecraft uh, or statecraft. And so um, this is not going, uh, uh, when we look at Beijing's uh, calculus, keeping India pinned down is, is much more fruitful for them. In fact, I can share a personal thing. Uh, both in Beijing and in Washington at different points of time, including when India conducted its uh, set of nuclear tests in 98. I heard friends from China tell me directly saying, this is a warning you should carry back to your capital, saying this is very dangerous for you. you know, I mean, that's part of the calculation of, of China. So uh, there is no intent and no will, therefore, to pursue peace. Uh, what China will do is find areas of agreement which are useful and practical at a short, uh, at a smaller level for both of them, but the larger posturing and and leveraging will continue. Uh, and in fact, the Chinese way of negotiation is that if I am uh, weak in my position in say issue area A, I will press you on issue area B, which I'll totally create there because I'm strong there. And if you want me to be fair on B, then I will say go easy on me in A, and that way I get good returns on both sides. So it's a very crafty way of, uh, of dealing with things, but that's my short answer. Thank you. So uh, an open question to Abe and Rick, uh, what do you think is the impact of COVID-19 uh, to the relationship of India and China, especially keeping in mind that India is very dependent on active ingredients from China and, and China, uh, Indian leadership as well as industry has pointed it out vociferously a few weeks back. Uh, yeah, I can take the first crack at it. Um, well, I think as was just pointed out, um, it, it's end up and be an area of competition, um, you know, in terms of uh, the ability to produce and deliver vaccines, you know, across the uh, region there. And I think to, to a large extent, um, it actually gave really sort of a, a, a surprising impetus to the quad. Um, the quad was a talk shop that would meet, you know, different levels, um, but looking for an agenda. And they certainly don't want to make it all about military. They didn't want to make it overtly about China. They want to they want to make sure the agenda, uh, you know, kind of has other elements built in. And to see, you know, the Deputy Secretary of State Steve Began, you know, convening Quad plus a few other countries for consultations about COVID response and collaborative action, um, you know, probably in some ways, you know, COVID gave the Quad a, a bit of life, you know, a, and a bit of a mission uh, that that has become more defined, you know, more recently. Um, with the announcement of, uh, you know, both uh, vaccine development, and I know the United States and India together are looking at uh, potentially exploring some other markets to source APIs. So it's it's proven another point of competition between India and China. Uh, on APIs and vaccine delivery, it's also, you know, shifted its attention to other partnerships, Quad in the United States. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the only other thing I'd say beyond that is, I think India and, and a lot of others, you know, pretty surprised with how aggressively, even in the middle of a pandemic, that China has been pursuing its claims, you know, across multiple jurisdictions simultaneously there. So, you know, the period too that you'd expect maybe, maybe countries are gonna be a little more domestically and internally focused, um, you know, seeing, you know, between Hong Kong and, and Xinjiang and South China Sea and other places in the border with India. Um, but uh, vaccine diplomacy and APIs are, are two real elements. And, you know, it looks like those are serving to, to push the two apart more than bring them together. Right, thank you. Abe? 
I, I completely agree with Rick on that. The only piece I'd mentioned before is that we, uh, scholarship has uh, shown us that in 1962, uh, one of the reasons China decided to go to war with India was out of concern that, that the Great Leap Forward um, had weakened perceptions of Chinese power and potentially emboldened India to press on, on these disputes. So I think there's some uh, who believe that because of the, especially because of the economic downturn as a, rela- as a, a result of the, the pandemic, I remember that China have had its slowest, um, its slowest uh, period of economic growth since the mid 1970s, since Mao was still alive. Um, there is a, uh, some believe that China may have been trying to push back on these issues, being a bit more assertive on these issues, including the border, um, in order to make sure countries don't believe that they're weak as they were in the early 1960s. Um, and there's, I think, um, the other side to this coin, though, is that as China believes that it's recovering more quickly than the rest of the world, they may try to start flexing their muscles a bit to test if other countries are internally focused and, and a bit weakened by the economic downturn. So um, I, I can see it both ways, but I definitely think that there's a geopolitical piece to this in addition to the um, direct uh, vaccine diplomacy, vaccine competition that we see coming through uh, the quad right now. Great, thank you. Now I have a question which I would like uh, any one of you to respond to, and it is from Mary Ellen. Uh, what is the Chinese leadership's answer about their non-compliance with treaties like uh, WTO, et cetera, and when they are dismissing international treaties uh, and law as uh, unfair, you know, to them? Sure, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And there's been some very good scholarship on this, um, that China's views of international treaties have changed um, over the decades, that initially uh, the PRC was extremely skeptical of most international treaties um, as tools of imperialism, et cetera. But as the decades have gone by, they've signed up to more and more and seen more of them as being in their interest, um, especially as it relates to um, economic uh, economic exchanges, uh, counter proliferation, uh, things like that. Um, but to me, the through line for all this is the calculations of the Chinese Communist Party of what's in their interest. Um, so some trade, some agreements like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, related agreements on uh, countering proliferation, countering terrorism, um, uh, the WTO broadly conceived, um, I think they see as in their interest, and so something they signed up to and. Uh, gain, gain, gained a lot of uh, and gained a lot of assets as a result of. Um, but they see other treaties like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, aspects of the WTO as unfair and as constraining Chinese interests. And therefore they um, maybe comply with them but do so grudgingly, or they comply with them but say they need exceptions because China is a special case, like you see in the WTO, um, a degree of Chinese, what I call Chinese exceptionalism. Um, so. Um, the only throughput, though, uh, to all of these is calculations about what's in China's interests. Um, there's very little sense about self-constraining self-constrain- themselves um, at, because it serves a broader public good. Um, because it, it may restrain them in this area, but because it restrains all countries equally, that's in their interest. Um, I have not seen that significantly informing Chinese uh, calculations that the decision to sign up again on the NPT, for example, is undertaken when they decide they didn't need to, that proliferation was no longer in their interest. Um, um, which I should say compliance with the NPT. Um, the, uh, similarly with the WTO, um, that they were happy to join up to its predecessors when they were needing economic development, but uh, these days they emphasize their role as a developing country in order to get out of some of the more uh, strenuous responsibilities of a, of a developed economy. Um, so to me, um, calling, China, calling on China to try to have some moral shaming on them to, get, to comply with international law because that's what good powers do, that's what major powers should do, I think doesn't seem to be terribly effective. Rather, I think it's more of a calculation about explaining to them what's in their national interests um, and how signing up to this treaty or that treaty would actually improve their national interests, I think is a much more um, effective argument. Thank you, Rick. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, not, nothing more to add. He, he covered it all. Perfect. All right. Anupam? 
just a couple of lines. I, I, yes, he did cover uh, very well. Um, I'll remind the audience that China conducted its last set of nuclear tests about 10 hours before it signed the CTBT in New York. Uh, so it, it is very pragmatic. Uh, on the NSG, it is very interesting. The nuclear suppliers group, uh, it denies or delays India's membership because it says a common criteria needs to be developed for it. Uh, but when it comes to China's own membership in different things, as, as uh, Abe said, uh, it, it looks at its own interests and says that I, I deserve to be treated as an exception in all of these things. And he's absolutely right. China is able to screen uh, media and information. So what flows out back to its own people is very heavily censored. I remember that I was, uh, some of my remarks were censored out on live TV in CCTV. And later they explained to me, we keep a six second loop. So if you say something we don't like, we'll edit it out in mid sentence. So China continues to use uh, information very uh, strategically uh, and the leadership makes these calculations of what is in China's interest. Uh, uh, and if you have to suggest something meaningful to China, then as Abe said, you must show that you're pursuing policy A, which has a gain of say six units. If you pursue policy B, you'll have a gain of 10 units. That China might be tempted to follow because it's more rather than use any moral persuasion. Um, that's it. Thank you. All right. With this, uh, we are towards the end of the program. And I want to thank all the three speakers. And I have a couple of uh, announcements for our next programs. And then I'll turn over to John. And John will turn over to Tony to wrap things up. On behalf of UIBS and its partners, Georgia Tech Cyber, uh, I am announcing two programs uh, for the audience uh, on April 21st. We are going to be doing reflections on the US higher education system and international students enrollment. It's gonna be uh, a, a, an executive level talk by uh, two or three uh, C-level executives from education field. We'll be announcing that pretty soon. Our second event, which is uh, planned for May 6th is uh, a deep dive into technologies uh, with help from about 12 C-level executives, uh, CTOs, CIOs, CISOs, about global trends in digital infrastructure. Both these are webinars and we will send you information. If you, anybody in the audience is interested, please write to me. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you very much to all the participants for taking the time and sharing your expertise with us. We look forward to further collaboration with you. And when we travel, visiting you up in DC. Uh, many of us spend a good bit, a good bit of time there. Um, we, it was particularly uh, uh, pleasant to be able to participate with ACIR today. It is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, Council on International Relations, International Affairs in the Southeastern region of the United States. So we hope also express a wish that uh, we will be working more with ACIR. On that note and on that thought, having not resolved the Indian-Chinese boundary disputes. I turn it over to Tony, who might have some suggestions. I know you wanted to make some announcements. So here is your chance, Tony. Thank you, very kind. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, uh, I am gonna take a moment, uh, Director of Programs, to at least point out to those of you that are not familiar with us that uh, on 7th of April, we are going to have the Chief Deputy of Mission for the United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, Shema uh, Gargash, and uh, she is going to speak to the UAE's accomplishments. And of course, uh, she has agreed with me that she will also speak to uh, the UAE in its relationship with Iran as well as Turkey. And I'm pleased she will not be ducking that interesting exchange. Uh, I wish to thank uh, uh, John and Ani uh, Cyber uh, UIB for the uh, opportunity to partner with them. And for all of the speakers, I wish to thank you so much for the clarity that you have brought to your thinking and your presentations and uh, the importance of stressing that more than ever, uh, unity among all of the democratic nations uh, in all of the continents is going to be uh, an imperative as we see this rising power, which we mustn't forget as we constantly reference China is really the communist party of China and that is a brutal group, and uh, they are very hard in a, uh, in a matchup. You know that, so we must not lose sight of that. And uh, I would say uh, with regard to India, 
from my observation, 30,000 feet, I would suggest to you that the greatest threat to China coming out of India is the continued uh, growth in democracy that India brings uh, to its domestic affairs. And as that occurs, China's internal pressures, I believe, are going to grow because all of their young people have access to the same technology that the rest of us have. And uh, a strong rising middle class uh, that has continued to grow in China is going to ultimately bring some great pressure upon the Communist Party. And uh, we will then begin to see the real cracks and weaknesses in that particular uh, nation state. So on that note, I wish to thank all of you really on behalf of the ACIR. We look forward to uh, seeing you again in different venues. Thank you. Thank so you, Tony. Uh, with this, I would like to close the session. I thank uh, once again to all the speakers and moderators and look forward to staying connected with you. Uh, I'm signing off everybody out now. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.